Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Anthony Cabot. Uh, I'm a professor at the Boyd School of Law. And one of the things I do over at the Boyd School of Law is teach gaming law. And one of the hotter topics in gaming law today is the question of sports wagering. So today what I want to do is, is give you an idea of the magnitude of the industry, the potential magnitude of the industry, the legal issues, and where it's going as an industry um, in, a, in a variety of different states. So let's start out with, what's the state of sports wagering? There's been a lot of estimates with regard to the size of the sports market, some of which I think are wildly exaggerated. So even back in 1998, when the National Gaming Impact Study Commission did their studies, they came up with a a range that was as high as $380 billion. That would be legal and illegal <laughs> sports wagering in the United States. I've always thought that's grossly misstated. And I think the more accurate ones that are coming out more recently is that the legal and illegal market in the United States is probably closer to the $200 billion mark. Now that's handle, that's amount wagered, not amount of, of um, net revenue with the National Football League being the most substantial, followed by college football. So let's take a look at, at Nevada, which, which, is the only, which has been the only legal state with single game wagering. So for 12 months ending July 2018, the amount wagered in Nevada was almost $5 billion, which I note has been up from 2.27 billion in 1998, so it's gaining in popularity. And we talk about margins in the, in the industry. The margins in the, in the sports industry are relatively small. So in Nevada, the Nevada books won an average of about 5.75% of every bet. So if you do the math, $5 billion, retaining 5.5%, 5.75%, the net revenues was about 270 million in the last trailing 18 months in Nevada. So that just gives you an idea of, of the industry. So we have Nevada, which is doing about 5 billion. The total market's probably about 200 to 250 billion. So it's doing a small fraction of the entire market, legal and illegal. So what are we betting on? This is from Nevada, which I think would be a good microcosm of the, of the broader economy. And again, it's football. Football is the most significant uh, sport in terms of handle. Uh, it's been down this year, but so if you look at the numbers from last year, uh, football would have been much more prevalent. Um, could be a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, followed by basketball, then baseball, and then all others are relatively minor compared to those. And again, I show you the win percentages um, off to the uh, far right. Okay, so a couple things that I think are important to note. And what, what's, you know, why is it more popular in Nevada now than it was 10, 15 years ago? The biggest thing is mobile gaming. It was introduced in 2011. It allowed people to bet on their mobile phones. And today, since 2011, net revenues have doubled. And it's almost entirely based on the fact that mobile gaming was introduced. About half of all gaming revenues in Nevada from sports are now done off of mobile phones. The other thing that's coming up that I, I think we want to note, because it's increasing in importance in the Nevada books and is already quite popular in Europe, is the concept of in-game wagering. So the, it's a difference between betting on who's gonna win the game versus betting on what the result of the next play in the game is going to be. So 
the, the value of in-game wagering is that it increases the churn. So while you may have a load margin activity, not unlike slots, if you get a lot of play, then the profitability of that activity goes up. So I think we're going to see in the next 10 years that in-game wagering is going to become as popular as single-game wagering, if not more so. So that's something that's coming that I think is going to dramatically change the market in the US. And we got to keep in mind that sports in general is increasing in popularity. And so I just, based on revenues in 2009, Total revenues for sports in North America was about $50 billion. By 2018, it rose to about $78 billion. So the, the clear trends are that sports are becoming more and more popular, which I think will help drive sports wagering. So that's enough about the industry. I'm a law professor, so I have an obligation to talk a little bit about the law. And this is really kind of important because this is what has changed the landscape in the US and brought this issue of sports wagering to prominence. So let me talk a little bit about the law. First thing you have to understand is something called the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution. This basically says that federal law supersedes state law, which means if the the federal government does something, as long as it's constitutional, it preempts state law, or it holds supremacy over, and it becomes the law of the land. So let's keep that in mind. I want to talk about PASPA, because this is how supremacy in, has basically stopped the spread of sports gambling outside of Nevada for, for 26 years. So in 1992, the federal government decided they were going to act to stop the legalization of sports wagering by states to, to increase state revenues. Interestingly, the, one of the guys behind that was Senator Bill Bradley, the famous New York Nick basketball player who became a, a, a senator from New Jersey. But they, de they decided to exempt Nevada and a couple other states that had different types of sports lotteries. And so they passed something called the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act. Nevada was the only state with single game wagering. So it was the only state that has what we recognize today as, as sports books. So what did it say? PASPA said that states are not permitted to sponsor, operate, advertise, promote, license, or authorize by law or compact any sports gambling schemes. So basically, uh, the federal government telling the state governments what they can and, not, they can and cannot legislate. It said you cannot pass laws legalizing sports within your state. And then the second provision said, and by the way, a private person who operates a sports book pursuant to the law is in violation of federal law. So it's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? Because if you operated a sports book in violation of state law, you'd be in compliance with federal law. But if you operated a book in compliance with state law, you'd be in violation of federal law. So that's basically what it said. And what the, the, the realistic effect of that was, was it stopped sports wagering throughout the United States. Nevada became the only state offering single game wagering. Delaware had some parlay cards. Uh, Oregon and, and uh, Montana had some sports lotteries that they kept for a little while, but they finally closed them. But for 26 years, basically Nevada had a monopoly over sports. Then New Jersey, under then Governor Chris Christie, decides we're going to challenge federal law. Now, it's a bit of ir irony here, and I'll tell you why it's a little bit ironic. When they passed PASPA to begin with, they gave New Jersey an exception. 
that if they legalized sports wagering within two years, they could do it on par with Nevada, and they decided not to. So they lost their exemption, and then 24 years later, come back and challenge the law. But they did, and they had a whole bunch of legal basis for doing that. They said equal protection or violation of the Commerce Clause. And then he came up with a third theory, something called commandeering, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which is ultimately the winner there. But they came out, and of course the NFL, which is obviously well-financed and a very public, uh, politically powerful force, basically was on the opposition of the state of New Jersey. They had been fighting any efforts to legalize any forms of, of, of wagering or the expansion of any existing forms. So when Delaware tried to get more than parlay cards, the NFL fought it. But they were the, they were the opponent in the Christie case. And it went through a number of maturations. It went up and down and up and down between the courts. There's Christie I, Christie II. Finally, Christie III, the Supreme Court of the United States takes the case. And it wasn't, it's really important to understand this wasn't about sports wagering. It was about the Supreme Court and their relatively conservative profile wanting to make a point with regard to states' rights. But sports happened to be the topic that they decided to do it on. And what they said was, it's unlawful for the federal government to dictate to state legislators what they're permitted to do and not do, right? So it's called anti-commandeering. The federal government cannot commandeer the state legislature and tell the state, hey, you can't legalize sports wagering, or you can. Now, they could have said sports wagering is illegal across the United States, and that probably would have upheld constitutional muster, but that's not what they did. They told the states what they could and couldn't do. And the Supreme Court didn't like that and basically said, that's unconstitutional. So they, they struck the first part of the PASPA, which said the state may not authorize. And then they basically sent to the second part that said, no person shall operate pursuant to state law. He said, well, those provisions are obviously meant to work together. Therefore, you can't strike down one without striking down the other. And they basically got PASPA and took it off the books. So where would leave us? It left us in a situation where there is no federal law that prohibits states from authorizing sports wagering, which means that states can go ahead and start authorizing all they want. But there's another law that we have to think about, too, when we start to think about how this new industry is going to start to sprout, right? So states are now authorized, or states are now allowed to authorize sports wagering within their own states. But the Federal, Federal Wire Act says that somebody who's engaged in the business of betting or wagering who uses a wire communication for transmission in interstate or foreign commerce of a better wager or information of setting, uh, in assisting or placing a better wager is violating federal law. So even if you're a legal book in one state, you cannot accept a bet from outside your state because you're in the business of betting or wagering. If you're using a wire communication facility, which is just about anything that uses a wire, in interstate or foreign commerce between two states or between a state and a foreign country for the purposes of, of receiving a better wager, right? So the Federal Wire Act effectively says, well, states, you can do what you want within your state, but what you can't do 
is you can't authorize someone within your state to accept a wager from outside your state. So you basically ring fence the states and say, you can do anything you want within your state, but you really can't do anything that affects interstate or foreign commerce. Well, maybe not anything, but certainly with regard to bets or wagers. Because there's a second provision. It's called the safe harbor provision. And this says that transmission in interstate commerce, and skip the first one, news reporting, for the second one, for the transmission of information assisting the placing of bets or wagers from a foreign country or state where betting is legal uh, into such a state where betting is legal. So information assisting in the placing of bets or wagers can cross state lines, but the bets or wagers themselves can't. Okay, so what's the difference? What's the difference between a bet and wager or information assisting in the placing of a better wager? A better wager, so let's say, say I'm talking to my bookie. And I say, hey, what's the line on the Cleveland Browns game? And they say, Cleveland uh, minus 15. That's information assisting in the placing of a better wager. It's not a better wager. We haven't agreed to the bet. My bookie's just telling me what the odds are. If I say, I'll take that bet, then a contract is formed, and that's a bet. So what this basically says is, you cannot accept bets or wagers across state lines. But information assisting in the placing of bets or wagers, i.e. things like odds, can go across state lines as long as it's between a state where it's legal to a state where it's legal. Okay? So if it's between Utah and any place, it's illegal, because everything's illegal in Utah. But if it's in between New Jersey and Nevada, which both have sports wagering, odds can cross state lines. Okay? That's going to be important for the business aspect, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So here's some common questions. Can sports books accept wagers from across state lines? No. They cannot. A legal sports book cannot accept a bet from outside its own state. Okay? It would violate the Federal Wire Act. Two, can states enter compacts or agreements like they did in poker to permit interstate wagers? I said, the answer is no. So you can't increase liquidity by agreeing, two states, two states agreeing that they're going to have common pools. So I think the answer is no. So that's going to be a, a restriction that's different than poker. Third, can a sports book with operations in multiple states do risk management across all sports books? Here's the answer is probably yes. So what does that mean for somebody in the industry? If I'm a bookie and I have books in Nevada and New Jersey and I'm trying to set the lines, I can use information from New Jersey and Nevada collectively to set the lines in the various states. I can't accept a bet from New Jersey if I'm in Nevada. I can't accept a bet from Nevada if I'm in New Jersey. But I can share the information for risk management purposes to set the lines in both jurisdictions. Okay. And is mobile gaming legal on even an interstate basis? Interstate. I'm sorry. I should say intrastate basis. Is mobile gaming even legal on an intrastate basis? Nevada's doing it. So I can bet in Nevada off my mobile phone to my Nevada book. In fact, almost 50% now of people place their bets using their mobile phones. But it's not clear if it's legal. Because there are some cases out there that say the use of the internet is interstate. Because the way the internet works, packets will go and route, and they cross state lines and come back. And therefore, it involves interstate commerce, therefore illegal under the Federal Wire Act. Nevada and everybody else is ignoring that, because they're making the argument that if, the, if the, the sender and the receiver are in the same state, it's not interstate, it's intrastate. But it's an open question still that I don't know if we'll ever get to court or not, 
But this federal Department of Justice could come down and say, okay, we understand what happened with PASBA. States can authorize wagering within their own state, but you can't do mobile. And that could put the whole industry in a, in a little bit of a tizzy because, again, mobile is going to be 50% of the market, is 50% of the market already. One thing, I, last federal law I'll talk about is the federal excise tax. There is a federal excise tax on sports wagering. It's one quarter of 1%. It's a handle tax. So the federal government right now is taking one quarter of 1% of all legal wagers. It came from an old law where they years ago tried to take the casino industry out of existence by putting a 10% tax on. They limited it to certain activities like sports. Over time, it got eroded to a quarter of 1%. But it is a quarter of 1% that's going to the federal government. OK. So let's talk about the consequences of the New Jersey case. By the way, the New Jersey case could be called the Christie case or it could be called the Murphy case. It was a Christie case for years and years because Chris Christie was the governor of New Jersey. He was replaced by Murphy. And so the actual title of the case is Murphy, but a lot of people call it Christie. So if you hear both, you'll understand why. I'll just call it the New Jersey case. There was a gold rush. States were preparing for the outcome that came the outcome that PASPA is unconstitutional and states can do what they want now. So five states have implemented full legal sports wagering. Nevada already had it, but Delaware, Mississippi, New Jersey, and West Virginia have already implemented legal sports wagering. Four more states are coming, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. Uh, lying in the wings is Ohio and Kentucky. I think in five years we'll have probably 20 to 25 of the states with full legalized sports wagering. So it's, it's very quick um, proliferation uh, of sports wagering across the United States. So I'll talk a little bit about the tribes. And I, I put up a little comment by Ernie Stevens, who's the NIGA chairman. And um, I think it, it's, it gives the sentiment of the National Indian Gaming Association towards sports wagering that it could be a good amenity uh, for the industry overall. So what happens with the tribes? If a state legalizes sports wagering, any of those states I mentioned, they're going to have to let the tribes do it. It will require an amendment to their compacts in most cases. But when Mississippi decided they were going to do sports wagering, they had to let the Choctaw do it. And the Choctaw actually became the first tribe outside of Nevada to have sports wagering. So the tribes will be involved in this activity uh, if they're in a state that legalizes sports wagering. Again, in most states tend to require amending the complex, uh, the compacts. Now, I think that negotiations are going to be very difficult in a lot of states. And I think, it's, I think California is going to be one of them for a couple of reasons, right? In a lot of states, the, the tribes have exclusivity to, to offer gaming within the state. They're usually paying something for that exclus exclusive rights in terms of some type of, I don't want to call it a tax, but it's a tax to have exclusivity. So the first question comes up is, do the existing exclusivity clauses grant the tribal government's exclusive rights to sports wagering without amendment? Right? Well, it depends on how the compacts are written. But in a lot of states, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits where the tribes are going to say, hey, we have the exclusive rights to all gaming within the state. This is gaming. Therefore, we have the exclusive rights to do sports. Other interests are going to be arguing differently, particularly the horse racing industry, which sees sports wagering as a natural complement to what they're already doing. What's the second one? Does permitting others 
to offer sports wagering violate the existing exclusivity clause. So effectively, what some tribes are going to say, look at if you allow the, the, the racetracks or somebody else, the uh, off-track paramutual parlors to offer sports wagering, it's going to, you could do that, but it's going to violate our exclusivity clause. Therefore, we're going to quit paying you the tax that we currently pay you now to have exclusive rights to offer casino gaming within the state. So those are going to be a couple issues that we're going to have to look at um, from, from that perspective. And, and so I, I, I look at Steve Stallings, who's the chairman of the California National Indian Gaming Association, and you can see how that issue is going to be a prominent issue in the state of California, right? California voters have on numerous occasions confirmed the exclusive right of California tribal governments to operate casino-style games. Legalization of sports betting should not be a backdoor to infringe upon our exclusivity. So for a lot of tribes in a lot of states, it's going to be, a big, it's going to be an issue that goes beyond, well, is sports wagering a good thing for our tribes or a bad thing? Uh, in itself to something which is going to be, is sports wagering going to impact our primary business casinos? And how is that going to do that? So we have to keep those in mind as well. Now, I also want to mention the leagues want in. The leagues have been going to every state particularly the Major League Baseball and the M NBA, and saying, if you legalize sports wagering in the state, we want an integrity fee. We want a certain percentage of the handle that will go to the leagues that will help us ensure that the games that are being offered by the sports books are fair and honest. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's way more than you need to do that because 1% of handle equals about 20% of net revenues. And we think that's just a greedy money grab. But that's what's happening, right? And they've actually brought in the support of certain members of Congress. So Chuck Schumer from Pennsylvania has proposed, says he's going to propose legislation which says that sports books can only buy the data they need to run their book, final results, from the leagues exclusively. Well, then you know what that means is that the leagues are going to charge for that, and they're going to get their percentages, right? So it's another thing we have to look at is, is, is this sort of who's, you know, who, how is the pie going to get split up because the leagues clearly want a piece of the pie. So watch that legislation. I think it's going to be interesting to watch. The leagues have not been successful in getting the integrity fees into the state laws. So the last portion, how much time do I have left here? Yeah, my last portion I, I want to talk about is the dangers of sports wagering to the casino industry. And I, and I think it's real, and I think it's something that we always have to be very concerned about, and that we do it right if we decide we're going to go forward with sports wagering. So I'll give you sort of my analogy, right? If we look at dishonesty in the casino industry, right? let's say a slot machine, which is supposed to be randomly based, isn't random, right? But it's rigged. It's rigged against the player. So it's not a random, random number generator. It's a one that's set to, to cheat the player. So what would happen? Well, the manufacturer would probably lose their license. They probably lose their license everywhere if that happened. 
the operator, if they knew about it, would probably lose their license, right? The player would be given their money back based on a player dispute mechanisms that are in place. And regulators would revisit their regulatory systems to assure that the situation never happened again. Now, has that happened before? Yeah, it happened in Nevada. People don't realize that years ago in Nevada, a manufacturer rigged video poker machines to cancel royal flushes, right? They lost their license, right? As they should. So this is a little more legal stuff. But wagers are contracts, right? And so if you, if you make a bet, you're basically saying, I'll give you my $20. If certain conditions come true, you're going to pay me. If certain conditions don't come true, you keep the $20. It's just a contract. Okay? And so if you cheat during that contract, it's, you're defra it's, a, it's a fraudulent contract, right? And you can get your money back. The difference between most contracts and casino contracts is that the casino contract is heavily regulated. One of the ideas of the, the casino contract is, in fact, that the random event is random. Honesty is the cornerstone of gaming regulation. And it's, it's so important. Without honesty, if you had a reputation as being a cheating place, right, a clip joint, as they used to call them, it's likely no one's going to come back to your casino once that comes out, right? It's sort of the, the Chipotle problem, right? If you know, if you get if you get an idea, if you get a reputation for not providing the services in a, in a fair and honest way, you have a problem. So how do we do that with regard to the casinos? How do we assure the integrity of every game in the casino, right? Well, first off, we license everybody. We license the manufacturers, we license the operators. With regard to the games, we have technical standards for all the games. We have extensive testing of every game before they go on the floor. The regulators have field observations and review of the games and devices. They do periodic audits of the games. They review the, the uh, results from the games to see if they're uh, in line with uh, the expectations of how the game should pay. We have internal controls that assist in assuring the, the games are, are fair and honest. We do all of these things in the casino industry to ensure the fairness and honesty of games. What do you do to assure the honesty in the sports world? Do we do any of those things? Does Nevada do any of those things now? Do all those states I just mentioned that are legalizing sports wagering do anything to assure the integrity of the game? We have two different industries. One, the casino industry, where we have this massive amount of checks and balances to ensure the integrity of the games offered to the patrons. And we have the sports industry, sports betting industry, where we do almost nothing to assure the integrity of the games that we're offering to our players. So who has responsibility? If it's not the regulators, who has responsibility to ensure the integrity of the games? That the tennis match that, that you're, you're betting on isn't fixed, right? That the college basketball games where they don't pay the kids anything aren't set up so that there's, there's some point shaving going on, right? How do you do that? Do we rely on the, on the sports governing bodies? Do we rely upon the government authorities where the event is held? Do we not care, right? Who's doing that? And some people will say, what's well, the sports bodies, right? The sports bodies ensure the integrity of the game. We can, we can feel pretty comfortable about that. But look at this, the IBF. This was the, the, the president of the IBF was sentenced to 22 months in prison for accepting bribes to adjust boxers. 
rankings, right? Could he ever get a gaming license? No. Are we going to rely upon the IBF to make sure the boxing matches are fair? Heck, boxing has such a, a great history, they even have a word for cheating. It's called tanking or taking a dive, right? What about FIFA, the, the, you know, the largest sports or uh, largest soccer organization in the world? 42 people associated with FIFA were charged in a far reaching corruption investigation involving bribery. Are we to rely upon FIFA to make sure that the games are fair and honest? Of the soccer matches? We would never do that in the casino industry, but we, we're, we're just sort of like this, oh, we're not going to worry about it in the sports industry. There's a problem there, I think. There's a problem in, in the proper regulation of sports integrity, which, is gonna, which, is, which presents an opportunity, opportunity that's been widely taken worldwide to exploit the wagering markets through competition manipulation, such as match fixing, that's where you fix the entire match, or point shaving, where you take a number of points and try to keep the, the game within a certain point level so that it affects certain wagers that are based on point spreads. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what is, what is game fixing, but game fixing is basically when you get to the players or a ref or someone else who's going to influence the game through fraud or bribery to manipulate the game results to help the fixer, the better who's betting into the game. So I'm not going to go through this. This is, this is sort of how it works, how competition manipulation works, how you get to the players and how ultimately you, you get to the fix, the performance, and the payoff. But this is kind of important. What, why, what, what are the market conditions necessary for a fix to be successful? Well, the first thing is, is you have to have access to liquid betting market. You need to have betting markets that are big enough that you can bet into once you fix the game. If it's a small betting market, the fix might cost more than you can make on the market. Right? If the maximum bet you can get down is $20,000, but it's going to cost you $40,000 to pay off the athletes, probably not worth it. Right? So you want these large liquid betting markets. You want to be able to place it into those markets with minimal risk of detection. So if there's a lot of paperwork being done in order to establish your account, In different jurisdictions, they're sharing your information with regard to your bets so that it, they, they show up as irregular betting patterns. That could be a problem, right? The third is a minimal risk that the target will report the approach. That's the athlete, usually. But it could be, that it could be an official, like a referee or something. <clears throat> we talk about referees. They're going to become increasingly important in this whole thing. With the, with the advent of in-game wagering. So I'll give you an example, right? Balls and strikes. Who calls balls and strikes? The umpire. If someone bets, is the next pitch going to be a ball or strike? And the better says, OK, on the, th on the third pitch to this batter, make sure it's a ball, right? If it's anywhere near the plate, it's going to be a ball, right? And we're you know, near the strike zone. If it's a perfect pitch down the middle, he probably has to call it a strike. But over time, that'll work for those people who are betting in-game. So referees can be a problem, right? The NBA, in their scandal, although he said he didn't do it, um, it was pretty clear that he was, he was calling fouls more closely on one team as opposed to the other, which influenced the point spread, right? OK. So you have to extend an offer consistent with the uh, maintaining a profitability of the uh, competition manipulation that the target would find useful. 
That means you're, you're, you're going to have to make more money than you have to pay in bribes, right? You have to have access to the target to convey the bribe. They usually do that through former athletes who are connected with the team who will get to the athletes and have a reasonable certainty that the target can produce the desired results. Different sports have different vulnerabilities. Tennis is one-on-one. -on -one. It's really easy to fix a tennis match because you only need one person to do it, right? Football is a little bit harder, right? Because you usually have to have more than one player who's, who's going to be involved in that game to throw the game. But it might be pretty easy to do one play in the game. So if you have a quarterback and then and on the first third and long, he has an agreement with the with a bookie to throw an incompletion, he can throw an incompletion, right? That's happened a lot in cricket with, with some of the, the rules of cricket, right? They, where they do the pitches. And the, the, the pitcher would do a certain act intentionally to help the, the bookies win a bet. So what about game fixing in the United States? I, I actually think at this moment, it's going to be pretty rare except by amateurs. And that's because the markets aren't big enough. Where it is occurring, and where we're, we're particularly vulnerable right now, is the illegal markets, right? So if you look at the illegal markets outside the United States, um, they're immense. Let's see if I have the number right here. Estimates of the size of the global, intermarket, global wagering market are between three and eight trillion dollars in handle. Right? So if I'm an illegal, if I'm a, uh, a game fixer, a manipulator, these are the markets that I'm going into right now. And Asia right now is, is the epicenter of that. Um, that's because I can, I can bet huge amounts of money into the Asian markets without being detected. And so I think most of the illegal money, um, I should have, most of the illicit money going on corrupt matches is going into the Asian markets right now. They don't have things like um, <clears throat> know your customer for anti-money laundering reasons. They don't have a lot of the protections um, that are more inherent in regulated markets. But that doesn't mean I just want to bring out one thing on this, this earlier slide. That doesn't mean that, that as the markets increase in the United States, that there won't be greater opportunities in the United States to use those markets to, to put money into as well. Um, I think they're more limited because they have less liquidity. Therefore, the amounts of the bets cannot be as great as they place in the Asian markets. But one thing that's very concerning to me is, is number two. And that is, is that the federal government has basically decided that illegal gambling is no longer a priority for law enforcement. They basically said, we're not going to be going after illegal gambling crimes anymore. They, in fact, they used to have a division of the gaming, I'm sorry, a division of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that used to concentrate on sports integrity violations, they've disbanded it. So there is no formal methodology to, to, to look at uh, sports integrity issues in the United States. And in fact, if you look at the number of arrests that have occurred, you know, they, in 1960, there's 123,000 arrests for illegal gambling. Um, by 2015, it's down to 4,800. And most of those are street crimes, right? Most of those are done in conjunction with going after uh, criminal gangs who happen to be playing dice in the alleys and things of that nature. So we have no enforcement anymore 
with regard to the gain fixing on a formal basis. And again, the, the, the internet has changed a lot too because I can place my wagers from here into these foreign markets, particularly in Asia. So what, ha what, is this, what has happened, right? What's happened is, is that we're finding the most popular games in the world that people bet on are becoming increasingly corrupt. And we don't see it because it hasn't quite reached the US yet in, in a real sense. American football, American baseball, American basketball have limited appeal outside of the United States. Right? So they, have, they don't have the huge illegal markets that soccer does, for example. But that's changing, right? Particularly basketball. Basketball is becoming a, a much more international sport. The amount of handle on basketball keeps going up and up outside the United States. Football is trying to do that with, with limited success. You know, they're having games now in different jurisdictions in Asia and in um, Europe. They're trying to expand its footprint. But if we look at soccer, and if we say, well, 10 years from now, basketball will be an international sport, and football will be an international sport, let's take a look at where soccer is today. This is in 2009. German police busted a sports, uh, sports fixing syndicate. That involved 200 people. They fixed over 300 soccer matches in nine countries, including some very you know, well-regulated countries like Germany, Belgium, Switzerland, um, and others. The scheme was financed by Singaporeans, backed by Chinese organized crime. They paid bribes of 100,000 euros which enabled them to make wagers in, in terms of millions of euros. And the bribes, the trail of money and the bribes involved 12 countries, including China, Malaysia, Singapore, Isle of Man, Germany, Russia, et cetera. So we've, we've encountered in a sport, which is the most popular spectator sport in the world, soccer, massive corruption or manipulation resulting from the fact that there's massive illegal markets. That was not the only one. This is a, a Europol investigation in 2014, which an Asian crime syndicate working with European organized crime fixed more than 680 matches over three years in 15 countries, involving 425 match officials, club officials, players, and criminals under suspicion. So who benefits and who, who gets hurt by that? Well, the common beneficiaries are the person who takes the bribe, right? And the corrupt influencers who, who pay the bribe and make the, their bets into the markets. Who gets hurt? Of course, the gamblers, right? Actually, the sports book operators as well. But the gamblers, if I'm betting on a game where I can't win, I'm a victim of a fraudulent contract, right? And so this is, a, this is a serious thing, particularly for jurisdictions that are casino jurisdictions that are used to assuring the honesty and integrity of the games. So I, I think you can actually segregate two things, because I think people confuse them. One is wagering integrity and the other one's sports integrity. So I think that the current structure of gaming in America, whether it be tribal or state, is pretty good at regulating wagering integrity. We're pretty sure through licensing and all of these things we do, internal controls and auditing and enforcement, that the operators themselves are honest that people are going to get paid if they win their games, right? 
and we're pretty sure that the games themselves are honest. When we get to sports, yeah, we can assure that the operator's honest. We can assure that they're going to be able to pay the patrons if they win the sports bet. But what we can't assure is that the games themselves are going to be honest. So things have to change, right? I think they have to change. I'll pass on some of these, what people are doing in other jurisdictions, and say, what do we need to change, right? I think it's perfectly fine that operators get licensed by the states or the tribes. I think that's, that's great. But what do we do to ensure sports integrity? I think there are seven things we need to do. The first thing we need to do is we need to establish and fund a national sports integrity program. Now, why do I say that? I mean, I, a lot of people are obviously have this negative reaction about the federal government getting involved in anything. And I say, well, in this case, they're the only ones that can effectively do it. Because let's say, for example, in West Virginia, the West Virginia regulatory authorities get some information that a tennis match that occurred in Germany was rigged. What exactly can the West Virginia authorities do about it? The answer is nothing. They can't investigate it. They don't have the resources. They don't have the jurisdiction, right? They don't have the ability to do anything about it. What we do need is we need something that is on a national basis, that is looking only at sports integrity, nothing else. They don't license the operators, they don't assure bankroll requirements, they don't do anything. But what they do do is they concentrate on sports integrity. And what are some of the things that they should be doing here? Right? And this is something that's different than anything we've ever done before. In order to detect corrupt games, you need data. You don't need data of exactly who the person's name is, but you do need data on the activity. You need to know how much is being bet on whom. We need a national center to collect all the data, to use the algorithms necessary to determine irregular betting patterns so that something that's irregular can be investigated. And a single state like West Virginia is, first off, the sample's not big enough to make a difference. And two, they don't have the capabilities of doing all that. So the first thing, establish and fund a national sports integrity program. Second, create a special sports integrity unit. We need to have an expert unit that is doing nothing but investigating sports corruption to be getting all the information from all the states, utilizing the advanced algorithms to determine irregular betting patterns, and doing investigations, or using suspicious activity reports that are going to be coming through all the sports book operators in the United States to start looking at these different things, right? To try to determine what's, what's uh, legal and illegal, and to work with the governing bodies and the sports betting operations and the state regulators and the foreign, foreign governments for the purposes of, of protecting sports integrity. I think we need to define the statutory obligations of the shareholders. We have to create this federal or national structure and say, hey, look, guys, this is everything that you're responsible particularly for to help doing this. So with regard to operators, you have to share data not customer names and things of that nature, but just the, the raw data. You have to report um, suspicious activities. You have to know your customer. Um, and maybe at some point to find what type of bets and bet types that the operators can or cannot accept because some may be more susceptible to corruption. You have to have rules for the sports governing bodies, education programs, governance, policing, and compliance programs. Next thing is we have to have uniform criminal laws. 
we can't have different states with different laws that deal with what constitutes corruption and the penalties. They have to be uniform. It has to be done at a federal level to do that. Fifth, extraterritorial jurisdiction. This is important because as we saw from the, the corruption that came out of the soccer um, matches, very little of this actually touches the United States often, right? Organized crime out of Asia, organized crime out of Europe, uh, matches in, in foreign countries, et cetera. You need somebody who has authority to actually do the extraterritorial jurisdiction, um, including working with the foreign governments on extradition to bring the criminals back to the United States for purposes of prosecution. And this follows through is this cross-border cooperation. You need a cooperation between the countries so that we're sharing now data with, with Asia and we're sharing data with Europe so that we can have a much broader ability to go after the international organized crime organizations that are behind a lot of the corruption. And this, is a, this is a really important one, right? How do we get from let's say 160 to $200 billion in illegal wagers to move those over to legal wagers in the United States. We have to have criminal enforcement. If the federal government just says, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing, which is nothing with regard to illegal sports wagering, will people in the United States actually switch to legal sports wagering? And it's, it, maybe not, particularly if they start taxing sports wagering at a higher rate so that they offer worse odds than the offshore bookmakers. The worst odds with non-enforcement, much of that money is going to stay offshore. Um, and when it's offshore, then it's untrackable. It's more subject to um, the, the fixers who, who, who like to bet into the liquid offshore markets. So I think that's it's an important point, but we have to start enforcing the laws if we're gonna to try to shift any of that revenues, a significant portion of that revenues over to legal betting. Questions? No? So, among the things that uh, we know is that uh, in many jurisdictions, in many countries, Gambling winnings are not taxed. Right. Now, I know that's a great departure for the U.S. It is. But were gambling winnings taxed at a lower rate or non taxable, using them simply as fortuitous events, then I think that's important. So there, and of course, that is anathema to the regulators. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain uh, elements present. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the UK and Canada, most uh, jurisdictions, lottery winnings are not taxable. Right. Now, I certainly don't have a total knowledge of it, but I know that to be the case yeah. in the UK, Canada, and many European uh, jurisdictions. So, that is a, uh, it's a different discussion, but it has bearing on the situation. I, I clearly agree, particularly with regard to what I call smart money, right? Because some, sometimes the, the fans who bet, I call them fanboys, aren't really all that attuned to right. this issue. Just but, stick with what's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But, but the, the smart money, clearly the, the taxation issue is a big thing, right? And it's not only what you talk about is, is, is your winnings taxable, right? But if the, if the state governments are taxing the bets themselves, such that the odds that the, that the, uh, uh, the sports books are offering are less attractive than the foreign or the offshore internet bets, they're still gonna bet with the internet bets, right? What's well, politicians, though? I mean, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a politician it's who are saying, right? It's a very difficult thing because they say, well, you know, we're taxing our casino industry at eighteen percent. Let's tax these guys at eighteen percent, right? But it's it's a different it's a different industry, right? And and we start taxing them at eighteen percent, it's going to affect the odds. It already does. Nevada, when they offer a game, it's usually at a less uh, attractive odds than the offshore books. And we're at a six and three quarter percent tax. If you go up to 18, 20 percent, you're going to be at a really significant disadvantage to the foreign books. So. All right. Thank you.